The second piece of content that was blocked by, I think it was CNN at the time, on Bernie TV Channel 2, maybe 3, I don't remember. We went through so many. This is, uh, this is Tom Fegan at the JJ dinner. I'm just going to show you what happens, and then I'm going to let Tom tell the story behind the scenes because we didn't know it at the time, but censorship had already started within the DNC and we were just brought, I thought, honestly, my naivety at the time was, oh, look at that. That's great. They let him carry a sign up there. So we're going <laughs> to, let's run this and, uh, and, and, and you guys enjoy. Stand up for Iowa families instead of standing for special interests. We've seen what Republican dysfunction has brought us in Iowa. We can do better. Our first mission is to send Chuck Grassley into retirement. <laughs> so I'm pleased to introduce our three candidates running for the United States Senate. Let's welcome Tom Fegan to the stage. Tom Fegan's campaign for the U.S. Senate has taken him to 84 Iowa counties, and the message he's heard from working families is loud and clear. Yeah. Okay. They want. They want Bernie. That. Cr <laughs> Good morning, Tom. That was badass. It gives me goosebumps to look at that. How are you doing? Whew. Good, John. Uh, that was that was an evening where um, I had my mojo on. And and let me give you the background. They decided they would not let the candidates speak, and so we were to submit a 125 word introduction. In my introduction, I endorsed Bernie, and found out that they had deleted that from my introduction that Andy McGuire was going to read. Unreal. The other thing is, the other thing that night in the hall, they had barricades up between the big dollar donors and what I would call the great unwashed, those of us supporting Bernie. You could pay $50 to sit on the bleachers, or if you wanted to have a table next to the stage, it was $5,000 a chair. Holy shit. And they, and they had metal barricades between the $50 people and the $5,000 people. I mean, it, it was reminiscent of the Titanic. Wow. You know, if you got big, if you got big money, you can sit next to the presidential candidates like Hillary, like O'Malley and like Bernie. If you didn't, you were separated from them by a metal barricade. And so nice. when it came time to introduce us, I had been at the rally with Bernie that had been out in the park across from uh, the convention center and we walked across a bridge and it was very reminiscent of the civil rights movement john we were locked in arms and there were thousands of people uh, my estimate is bernie had half the six thousand people there we walked wow. locked in arms to the hyvee convention center when we got there they had mental uh detectors because of the secret service it took two hours for me Two hours for me to get through the metal detectors Holy and there were a lot of millennials that had sat on the floor were laying on the floor because of the delay and i think it was on purpose to discourage the bernie supporters from coming in so all of this is background to this introduction i take my bernie sign from the march up to the stage with me and when andy mcguire endorses me i hold the sign above my head and i'm telling you the roar from the crowd was so loud it rocked the stage. It was 3,000 people screaming. I had some people tell me afterward it was like a bomb went off. <laughs> and it was, one of the, it was one of those moments. And the interesting thing is Andy McGuire just finished her term as chair of the Democratic Party. Uh -huh. from, that, from that night forward, John, she never spoke to me again. Never really? even acknowledged. Never even acknowledged my presence when we were at events together. Wow. 
Is she around now? Is she she get removed by the Republicans or is she a Republican? Is she... <laughs> Just... Too funny, too funny. She's actually running for the Democratic nomination for governor. Really? She's on, she's the odds on favor to get it because of the vast amount of money that she can lay her hands on. She's a physician. Her husband is also a physician. He's an orthopedic surgeon. One of the reasons they made her party chair in 2014 is that she can reach out to the millionaires and the billionaires and raise late, basically unlimited funds. And now she's running for governor, John, and she's the odds on favor to become the Democratic nominee because of the unlimited resources. The interesting thing is before she was chair, she was a registered Republican. She is a really recent Democrat and she is Republican light. But because of the resources she can bring to the table, she's expected to win the nod and the Democratic Party. There are seven people already in the race to be a Democratic nominee for governor. There's two or three more that are, are anticipated. They could have 10 or 12 people running for the Democratic nod. But none of them so far have the ability to raise the kind of money that Andy McGuire can. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. It is, it, it is ridiculous. It's basically a Republican that decided to go undercover. Yes. <laughs> That's what it sounds like, well, which, which is what we're talking about doing right now as Democrats or whatever party we're trying to figure out. I'm so sad about the state of the Democratic Party within our state of democracy. It's really not a, not a good thing, you know. Uh, and, 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 in Iowa, yeah. and I, in Iowa, John, our Democratic Party is shooting itself in the foot. Yeah. The Hillary forces are taking over control. They're telling the Bernie Kratz, you know, be reasonable, compromise, do what we want you to do. And what I'm seeing in Iowa, John, and maybe you're seeing this nationwide, is the Bernie Kratz are trying to figure out, do we stay and reform it or do we leave? I was one of those that chose to leave. In Iowa, we've got the Green Party that's reaching out to the Bernie Kratz. We've also got the Democratic Socialist Movement reaching out to Democrats. And just this week, there is a new group being started calling themselves populists. It started in Nebraska and it's moved across to Iowa. And actually this morning, I had one of the founders reach out to me to ask me if I was interested in joining their populist party, their populist movement that is starting in the Midwest. Basically, uh, Bernie supporters that don't believe the Democratic Party can be fixed. We need to let it die and we need to build something that's true and real, not Republican light, not corporate PAC money suckers. Interesting. And so, so you don't agree with the idea or you don't think it, it might be possible then to, uh, Bernie calls it transform the Democratic Party. I call it hostile takeover. Um, you really believe that we have to just pull everybody out of it and, and rebuild everything under a different party, but nobody agrees on the party, Tom. And do we have enough time to rebuild that kind of infrastructure? That's my worries, you know. John, John, let me ask you if you've ever done any building remodeling or house remodeling there comes a point with every building where it's too rotten to fix hmm. you know Interesting. you you would spend more money to try and save that house than the house will ever be worth that's where the democratic party is the interesting thing is tom vilsack who is our former governor was secretary of agriculture under obama at the end of his term in the department of ag he said the democratic party represents this majestic tree that looks so strong from the outside, but its inside has been totally eaten by the insects and is totally rotten. And it was a perfect analogy. The funny thing is he's a corporate Democrat. Tom Vilsack never saw a contribution from Monsanto that he could say no to, but for him to <laughs> analogize the existing Democratic Party to a giant majestic tree that is rotten on the inside is spot on. Wow. Spot on, John. In, and when a tree is that far gone, all you can do is cut it up and try and find some good pieces of lumber. In it. You can't you can't save the tree. This party is the mafia. And nobody ever talked about reforming and legalizing the mafia, John. I, you know? So, I, I mean, Tom, you and I have talked a lot about this stuff. I got a lot of respect for you. But you know that I, I from a pra from a practical point of view, I'm going I get the tree analogy. It makes sense. It's eloquent. It fits. From a practical point of view, I don't know how we replace that infrastructure. I don't know how we get on the ballot in all of those states when we can't even unify under another party name and we spend more time infighting and bickering with each other, even the independent media entities. 
The, 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 the government's like, we spent 40 years building this democratic infrastructure, 40, 50 years. Republicans are like, we did the same. Tea Party came in and said, you know what, we're just going to take over the existing structure. I don't like the Democratic Party either. Here's the, here's the thing that I'm concerned about. I, I mean, I voted for Jill Stein. Let's put it there, right? I voted for Jill in Oregon. Me too, me but, too. But, but only because I knew that in Oregon, it really didn't, my vote was irrelevant, right? That Hillary was going to get that Democratic vote either way, and I figured I might as well put a vote on the tab for Jill Stein, right? That was why I did it. If Bernie Sanders, who is inarguably the leader of the progressive movement across the United States... If he isn't willing to move, I mean, he's the uniter. He's the unifier. If we can't do it on our own and he's not willing to say, go here, other than, he's saying Democratic Party. Why are we fighting our own leadership? I, I, guess that's, I guess that's what I'm asking right there. Is there a point, let, let me put it this way. Is there a break point where you think that Bernie will say, all right, enough is enough. This is too much. Is, do you think that exists? Is that what we're hoping for here? John, short answer. Bernie is 75 years old. He's mm. in the twilight of his career. He's trying to maintain some leverage in the Senate. If he were to form a breakaway party, Chuck Schumer would, caught, would cut him off at the knees. And so I understand from Bernie's perspective to try and maintain some leverage in the Senate, he's got to do what he can do. The people who are going to form the new party are the millennials. The millennials are not going to follow Bernie with the Democratic Party. Two things I want to add to that. Look at Look at when Lincoln won the presidency. The Republican Party was in its infancy. It would not take that long for us to build a national party to challenge the Democrats and to basically move them into the dustbin of history like the Whig Party, okay? Interesting. So it, it can be done relatively quickly. The second question, the second point I wanna make is, how many more terms do you want Nancy Pelosi to serve in the House where she votes with corporate Democrats, Republican light. The longer we stay with them, the longer we accept the health care mess we have instead of single payer, the longer we stay with them, we give Wall Street control over our government and our economy. How many more years do you want Wall Street to own every part of the DC complex? You know, well, and until we say, you know, kiss it goodbye, do something different, we're basically agreeing, John. Wall Street calls the shots on both sides of the aisle. There are no Republicans and Democrats. No. There's Wall Street and there's Wall Street. You right. can't vote against Wall Street in the current structure. We have to walk away. And the sooner we walk away, the sooner we can get what we want. Is it going to mean wandering in the wilderness in 18? Maybe. Maybe. But if we do it now, we can be ready for 20. And we can put our people in positions to win in 20. We can push for campaign finance reform. We can push for single payer. We can push to, push to break up Wall Street. We can push for fair trade agreements. If we stay with the Democratic Party and fight a civil war within the party, we're wasting resources that we could be spending to build new infrastructure to be ready for 20. Wow. Interesting. I mean, I, I listen, I'm all excited about the idea of building a different party and shunning the entire Democratic Party party infrastructure. I'm all for that. Uh, having uh, experienced a little bit of the frustration with what it takes to even get a name on a ballot or what it takes to even get your uh, your candidate in, involved in election with the corruption, particularly in Iowa. You were telling me earlier that Iowa is basically a complete corporate Republican owned state at this point. Democrats don't have shit for power, right? That's where you right. guys stand. Right. right. In 16, the Republicans wiped out the Democratic Party. They took control of the Iowa Senate. They held on to the Iowa House. They have the governor. They jammed some of the most corporate friendly, anti-worker, anti-individual legislation through this session, John. It was horrible. And the Democrats were completely worthless. They were impotent. All they did was what I call jazzercise protests. And they have abandoned rural Iowa. We have 99 counties, John. Okay. And the Democratic Party carried six through oh, Hillary in six, only six of the 99. Wow. There's, there's complete swaths of the state where there's not a democratic organization whatsoever. Wow. And when, when they elected the new chair to replace Andy McGuire, everybody said, we need to reach out to rural Iowa. Nothing has happened. The new chair was elected in January. Nothing has happened. 
the, the candidates running for governor, with the exception of one, are all from those six counties. Most of them are from Des Moines. Wow. And I got to tell you, in Iowa, John, everybody else hates Des Moines. Des Moines is the capital city, 500, 600,000 people. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's one of those places where if you're a politician, you don't want to be from Des Moines because everybody else in Iowa hates Des Moines. So what's the Democratic Party doing in 2018? They're running all candidates from Des Moines like Andy McGuire. Oh, Andy, Mag Andy McGuire doesn't know the difference between a Hereford and a Heifer. You know, and she's coming out to rural Iowa doing photo ops, standing in front of farm, you know, barns, and she's got on her, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue jacket standing out in the farmyard. <laughs> Jared she Kushner? Wants... She's the Jared Kushner for Iowa? Is that what she's yeah. doing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wearing a blazer out there in the middle of the farm. <laughs> yeah, you got the picture. You got the picture. You could, you could draw the photo. You could, All right. You could take it. Bingo. Let me let me. All right. So you just told me something that I, I, I think is actually really. First of all, it's terrible where the Democratic Party sits in Iowa with six counties out of 99. <laughs> that's terrific. That's ah. but I but I, I just want to point out something, though. You also said that there are counties that don't even have Democratic representation. Right. Right. So to make it even worse, to make this even more sad folks we all agree that iowa right now is not exactly a progressive state the people may be progressive they just don't know it but it's not controlled by any progressives uh washington state in contrast we could all maybe say more progressive in some ways certainly has more democrats in power certainly has more of a progressive uh, bent to it washington one of the states it's going against uh 45 in a lot of ways right i mean compared to iowa wouldn't you agree Right? Yes. So here's the scary thought about Washington State. And I saw this post from Chad Lupke's earlier today. Um, the, uh, I, I, sorry, it's File, File of Palooza is this site that they created for Washington because there are more than 2,000, 2,000 Democratic positions open. 2,000 positions that can be filled by people within the state of Washington. Stupid positions like the one I took, right? PCP for a county or being a school board person over here that really just require putting your name on it and taking the power. So if we've got that kind of vacancy in a party, why not use it? It's, it it's, I understand that it's rotten. I understand it's a tree, but it sounds to me like most of the trees are empty and it just needs the roots filled with the grass. I don't know. That's where I'm at. I'm willing to go either way because right now we've got a ticking time bomb and I just want to sideline on all of this the talking ground game. I want your opinion as somebody who's way more educated on political stuff than I am. What do you think is going down in the government? Do you think any of this is going to matter? I don't think impeachment. I don't think they want it. I think the Republicans don't care. Does any of this matter? Is it just lend fuel to the fire for the for the movement? Well, one of the things I would say to you as a progressive is that I do appreciate the chaos that Trump is bringing. Yeah. It's finally to the point that he does not have any support in D.C. Uh, look at his 100 days. The only thing they accomplished, John, was a stopgap budget. Everything that passes right. the House with Paul Ryan goes to the Senate to die. He, need, he can only lose two, maybe three senators. And... You know, the list keeps growing every day of senators that keep edging away from him. You know, John McCain hates his gut. Lindsey Graham is becoming more and more independent every day. The women Republican senators like Lisa Murkowski, uh, like Olympia Snow, um, they keep, you know, siding away from him. Plus, he's got three presidential candidates that he absolutely annihilated. Rand Paul, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz. Every one of those guys want to stab him in the back. So the good news is what's going on in D.C., John, it, it's adding to what I call the, the chaos. You know, I, you know, let me just say, I think it creates an opening, an opportunity for progressives to step forward because the Republican Party is being destroyed by Donald Trump. You know, right. they, can't, they can't completely abandon him. They can't love him. You know, the, elect <laughs> the electorate's turning against him. There's a there is an opportunity here, John. This is one of those perfect storms where you've got the Republican Party being destroyed from within. Yep. You've yep. got the Republican Party and they now realize that their love of the billionaires is killing them electorally. And uh -huh. what you see is you see these tortured souls 
between these people who have taken millions and billions of dollars from the Koch brothers, the fossil fuel industry, and Wall Street. And you see that that is leading the people to come towards their town halls with mm -hmm. pitchforks mm -hmm. and torches. You know, it, it, is, it is just wonderful to watch these town halls in Iowa. We've got First District Congressman Rod Blum. Yeah. Where, where the part, people handed out uh, slips of construction paper that are on one side green, where you agree with him, one side red, where you disagree. There are photos that are just classic photos taken from behind him of the crowd. The crowd in Cedar Rapids, 1,700 people. Damn. The signs were about 1,650 red, no, and hell no. And there were, you know, maybe 40 or 50 green signs. It was just, you know, like I say, classic photojournalism where you show this Republican congressman in a town hall and 95% of the people in the town hall are holding up red pieces of paper saying, you suck. Yeah, I yes. disagree with you. And check this out. This is, yeah, you were talking about, here's Blum. I had this article on him. Here's a father that brought his son in. His son suffers from epileptic seizures. Uh, Dale uh, and, Todd. And Dale Todd. Yep. Adam is 18, and Adam could really benefit from cannabis oil. It has been uh, just a Herculean effort to get cannabis oil for epileptics in Iowa. It's ridiculous. And Adam is going to need the assistance of Medicaid the rest of his life because yep. of his epilepsy and his other medical conditions. And the position that Blum was advocating was just nonsensical. Yeah. And so Dale Todd stands up with Adam, with Adam beside him, and confronts this guy face to face and says, you're full of shit. Yeah. Were you there? Here's my son. Were you there? I was, I was not, but I saw clips. Yeah. And there's actually, there's actually clips of it on Facebook, John. And I know Dale, and Dale's one of those guys that calls it like he sees it. Nice. You know, he is, he's a progressive. He's an advocate. And his son has been the center of his life. His son runs cross country. Um, and, and Dale and his wife have done everything to give Adam quality of life. But they're going to need the help. Adam's going to need the help of Medicaid the rest of his life. And Rod Blum is one of these you know, evangelical Christians that say, you need to depend on the free medical clinic. You need to depend on your church, blah, 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 blah. You know, all of that is complete, pardon my French, bullshit. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and he and, says. And, it, and we. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. We had 1,650 out of 1,700 people that said the same thing to him. Mr. Or Congressman Blum, you're full of it. Nice. Nice. That's 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 what I'm talking about. He's got pressure now, right? He's yes. hopefully you've got enough pissed off people that are in his uh, district that are going to get rid of this guy at this point, right? But he, they're fighting a big money Fingers. machine, right? Fingers crossed. He's he's wealthy. You know, one of the sad things also about politics, John, is right now we have a lot of self-funded people. Yeah. Rod Blum is a multimillionaire made his money in software you know he doesn't care where you or i think you know he writes a million dollar check to his campaign buys the tv ads and he won this last election by eight points over a well-funded corporate democrat wow you know it's gonna it's gonna take a lot to blow him out but thank god he's helping us by coming out there and saying stupid things in his town halls yeah and getting the and getting the blowback from the people that's what i couldn't believe in in, in this article he after this after the father confronted him he says, well, my provisions won't take that out. And they, and like you said, the whole audience was like, bullshit. <laughs> you, you can't, exactly. you don't get to lie directly. This is the beautiful thing. Tom, two years ago, I don't think the American populace was this awake. We weren't this pissed. We weren't this aware of the bullshit today. It's a different story, don't you think? Absolutely, John, absolutely. One of the things that I've said to my mother, who's a McGovern Democrat, Bernie Sanders opened my eyes yeah. to the corruption within the party and within the political world. Now that I am awake to it and aware of it, I cannot close my eyes. And John, that's true, I think, of about 100 million people in this country yep. that woke up with Bernie Sanders in 2015, 2016. They're not going to go back to sleep. They're not going to go back to La La Land where they pretend that billions of dollars in corporate contributions from Wall Street and the fossil fuels industry makes no difference. Right. You know, the great lie, the great lie now that is being told by Democratic elected officials in Iowa and D.C., 
this money has no influence on my vote. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, I can see your lips moving. I know that you are lying. You know, why else would you vote to ban the importation of drugs from Canada? Right. Senator, Democratic right, right. senator. Right. Right. Democrat, supposedly Christian Democratic senator. So, right. Let's let's not forget that, that these all these folks pro proclaim to be such good wonderful people wanting to take care of everybody unless it's going to cut into their profit margin right that's let's not forget that tom you i just want to tell you if you do decide to run because you have mentioned that some people are trying to talk you into that uh, yeah you know i want to say we've you've got our audience is ready to back you. We've got people who have said, I'm in Tom's state. Let me know if you let him know I can work with him on his ground game. Does he need help in social media? You've got an army ready. Just want you to know. All right. Thank you, John. Um, a lot of people are twisting my arm. There is a Facebook group that has 400 members that are all lobbying me to run for governor as an independent. Excellent. The interesting thing is I was, I was invited to a meeting at a county that was all Democrats. They're still nominal Democrats. But the leader of this group said to me, we look at the eight candidates running on the Democratic side for governor and we want to puke. We think that you're the guy. And I've said to them, find me four million dollars. Uh, and they say, well, OK, that might be a problem. And, <laughs> you know, one of the things I've said, I, ra I ran my last race in the Democratic Party on a shoestring. Yeah. Uh, raised about forty five, fifty thousand dollars. That's not going to cut it. No. And so I've said to all these people twisting my arm. Help me, help me find the money, and I appreciate the support of your audience uh, with social media and the ground game, John. Um, I've told everybody, keep your powder dry. I've not made a decision. I've been invited to two more meetings All right. uh, with, with groups. Um, the first meeting we had, their group normally has seven or eight people show up. We had 29 people show up. They were ecstatic that nice. we had 29 people show up. And it was a good meeting, and we had a great exchange, but uh, there's a there's a lot of work that goes into running for public office in a state like Iowa, especially if you're going to do a grassroots campaign. I'm not there yet, John. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate the offer and uh, <laughs> I'll let you know. All right, Thank well, you. I agree. I appreciate that. And I just want to, I just want to comment on what you said about money, because this is so true. When we first started all this stuff, everybody was very touchy about money because money was one of the big issues. But if we're going to fund our own people, if we're going to get rid of the corrupt people, Money, look, that's what they have. That's the ammunition for politics. It's all about how much cash do you have. And you said $4 million. I think that's being conservative because it is. It, you're it talking is. one and a half to $2 million is what you really needed to run as a senator. So you're going, Governor, you need at least $4 million. And I'm looking at everybody in the audience and saying, we have raised that much easy for Bernie. We can do it for Tom, right? So... There it is. Tom, thank you so much for coming by. You're welcome anytime, and I hope that you choose to run and we can help you. <laughs> thank you, John. Thank you. Awesome. Tom Feagan, everybody, former Iowa Senate candidate, original Bernie Krat, and uh, somebody who actually might be interested in representing the people of Iowa just to represent them as a public servant. It's a crazy idea. It doesn't happen these days much anymore. <laughs> it's a crazy idea. I know.